Hello, and welcome to today's Textile Talk. I am Marin Hansen, Curator of International Collections at the International Quilt Museum, which is located at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Textile Talks are presented by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and Surface Design Association. We love bringing you these free programs every week, thanks to the support of our sponsors and contributions from viewers like you. Next, please. I am pleased to be hosting today's discussion on the topic of a new deal for quilts, which is the title of the International Quilt Museum's latest exhibition and companion book. The curator and author of A New Deal for Quilts, Yannickin Smucker, We'll be talking today with author and quilt collector Roderick Kira. Excuse me, Roderick Kirikoff. <laughs> Next slide, please. Your name is a little bit of a, a mouthful for me today, <laughs> Roderick. <laughs> but before I introduce them, I'd first like to encourage you all to come to the International Quilt Museum to see the exhibition for yourself. It will be up until April 20th. So make your road trip plans now. It is beautiful. Next, please. There are over a dozen outstanding 1930s era quilts on view in A New Deal for Quilts. And there are many other quilt exhibits for you to visit as well, including World War I quilts from the Sue Reich collection and Multifaceted, a showing of the work of artist Katie Pasquini Mazapist. Next, please. If you're not able to come to Lincoln, please visit our interactive virtual tour of the exhibition, which you can find on our website, internationalquiltmuseum.org. Next. Finally, because I know you'll be captivated by the quilts and historical photographs you'll see today and will want to learn more, I encourage you to order the book, which is now available through the University of Nebraska Press website, as well as other online booksellers. It would make a wonderful Christmas gift for your favorite quilt and textile lover or for yourself. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to remind you to please use the Q&A section for questions and the chat section for comments. We will address questions during the discussion when and if appropriate, but definitely in a Q&A session at the end. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Yannickin Smucker and Roderick Kirikoff. Yannickin Smucker is a professor of history at Westchester University in Westchester, Pennsylvania. She specializes in digital and public history and material culture and often incorporates digital humanities projects into her classroom teaching. Author of the groundbreaking Amish Quilts, Crafting an American Icon, Yannickin lectures and writes about quilts for popular and academic audiences. She also hosts and co-produces the podcast Running Stitch in partnership with the nonprofit organization, The Quilt Alliance, drawing on oral histories with contemporary quilt makers. For more than four decades, famed quilt collector and best-selling author Roderick Kirikoff has been sought out by major art museums and top quilt industry figures for his exceptional taste, experience, and advice. He is the author of influential publications such as The American Quilt, A History of Cloth and Comfort, 1750 to 1950, and more recently, Unconventional and Unexpected, American Quilts Below the Radar, 1950 to 2000. We at the International Quilt Museum are especially delighted to be the home of the Roderick Kirikoff collection of 35 of the quilts he collected over the years, including many from Unconventional and Unexpected. So with all of that, let me now hand the discussion over to Yannickin and Roderick. Um, I'll, I'll go first and I'll try not to talk too much, Yannick, and I want you to talk. Um, thank you everyone for showing up. I'm shocked and pleased and not surprised at how many are joining us today. Uh, we're going to cover, I'll try to cover a lot of ground. Yannick and is those who know of her great Amish quilts book. It's loaded and packed with new information. 
a new deal for quilts is no different. It's packed and full of information. I have learned a lot and I've um, gone through most of it very quickly. It will go back for, for more details. Um, but um, do do buy the book. Um, also want to say <clears throat> we may get to some places where we're talking or I ask a question about something that we don't have a slide for. Um, and we just ask that you be patient and listen. Um, that there isn't always going to be a visual. Uh, on my way over, I'm, I'm here at Tatter in Brooklyn, New York, I'm in the Tatter Blue Library. I'm not in the blue part. There's a tour today at, while we are talking now. Um, but if you do come to Brooklyn, do check out Tatter and the Tatter Blue Library. It's a wonderful um, resource. Um, I initially, Yannickan, was going to ask you about to say some words about the Amish quilts, but I'm not sure we're gonna have time. Um, if you want to just go on <laughs> from that, um, we'll dive more into your book. But now I was so surprised when you put this slide up in the show. Um, that's my book. <laughs> Why did and, you, why have yeah, you can, put this? Can I just oh. step in really quickly? Yeah. Right now we're yeah. seeing your presenter view. We're not seeing Oh, you are? Our, yeah. Okay, we're that's not, not what you're supposed oh. to see. I, I was trying to there use feet to like get to see the slides that were coming, but I guess that's not <laughs> gonna work. Um, okay. you're, thank you're you for letting me know. Well, I'm gonna need help then from both of you to know where uh, the next slide is. Um, uh, thank you for letting me know though. Um, I put this slide in, Rod, because um, as you know, when you, it was about 10 years ago when you uh, got in touch to see if I would be interested in contributing an essay to the, the first, the original edition of this uh, book, which speaking of a sales pitch is please buy this book if you don't have it already, uh, you're missing out um, on a wonderful collection of essays, but uh, a spectacular collection of, of quilts. Um, when when Rod invited me to write about some of the earliest quilts, the early 20th century quilts that were in uh, the unconventional and unexpected collection that he'd been assembling for um, quite a few years, I of course said yes because you, you got to say yes if uh, if Rod calls uh, and invites you to do such a thing. But it was such a it was it was right when I had finished um, my work on the Amish um, quilts book and I was moving on to some other things and I'd been working in close collaboration with the, the International Quilt Museum in Marin uh, on a world quilts uh, project, which is a, a digital online mo module. And um, as I was thinking about these early 20th century quilts, I was looking at photographs uh, from the Farm Security Administration photography collection, which was assembled uh, by professional photographers during the New Deal. And I kept seeing more and more pictures of people, usually women, uh, sometimes posed in the midst of making a quilt or posed with a finished quilt. Um, and this particular photo um, uh, we included in the first edition of, uh, of Unconventional and Unexpected, because it's a woman from the time period turning to her scrap bag and, uh, and stitching uh, bits and pieces together. And it was a really, the process of writing this essay was very formative in my thinking about what became has now become a new deal for quilts because I started to think about how how we framed the idea of uh, of scraps and thrift and and the salvage art of quilt making during the Great Depression. Um, people have probably always used bits and pieces of a variety of things in their quilt making, but. Um, Lots of 19th century quilts are made with with new fabrics or maybe fabrics that are left over from dressmaking, but um, they aren't as much of a scrap mentality or of a, of a, or a reuse um, making do until we get into this really the depression era uh, in the 20th century when people are nostalgically thinking about quilts and quilt making, but it's also a necessity and it becomes fashion as well to 
uh, assemble bits of bits and pieces of a variety of things into one's quilts. Um, and there was a lot of pride uh, in in this kind of thriftiness um, during the Great Depression. And it was working on on this essay for for Rod's book that really started me going down the road thinking about these mm -hmm. these issues of of how our idea of a quilt and our idea of thrift and and all of, of craft making and all of this really shifted um, during the Great Depression. Uh, I've, the project has taken off in lots of other directions, but this is one of those early nuggets. Thank you. Um, it's it's been a real pleasure and honor for me. The number of people that have said how they've been influenced by quilts in unconventional and unexpected in their own making or how they view quilts. But it was really exciting to me when you said this quilt, this essay sparked this interest for you um, and that a whole nother book has come out, um, which I think is really wonderful. Um, I forgot one thing that I had thought this morning. Um, I was really curious if people who are participating, listening, viewing would put in the chat how many people in the our audience might have lived through the depression or had a next generation experience of it through grandparents or parents hearing stories um it just it will be fascinating for Marin to kind of look at what kind of responses we get there um well i'm glad you showed the photo because that's one of the things about your book that um, really intrigued me. Um, I've loved photography. I've collected photography. I've seen so many of these. <clears throat> I was calling them WPA photos. And at some point, there are a lot of initials in your book <laughs> about the <laughs> New Deal programs. Um, and As you mentioned at least I remember learning about the New Deal when I was probably in, you know, middle school and hearing the phrase alphabet soup because of all of these oh. things, uh, acronyms. It's very challenging. Yeah. Right. You mentioned one, the farm. Um, the Farm Security, Security Administration. <laughs> Administration, right. The FSA. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd seen a lot of these photographs in other books, in exhibitions, and, you know, I re have responded to them, and many of them are considered kind of fine art photographs. People collect them for the imagery and all that they bring. But it was fascinating how you put them, a lot of them, here in the book together. And you have some very insightful analysis on how these photographs came about um, and how they were used in the depression. Do you want to talk? It is important to, to kind of to understand like the context of these these photographs. Um, this is not one of them. Here's another one, yeah. just to something else to look at. Um, the, the Farm Security Administration uh, was was staffed. They hired professional like studio photographers, what were called also documentary photographers mm -hmm. to capture real life in the United States, um, particularly the plight of lots of migrant um, farmers, lots of tenant and sharecropping farmers, which mm -hmm. uh, are you're seeing an image um, of a sharecropping uh, family or members of people who lived in G's Bend when it was still a, a sharecropping enclave. Um, and the the idea of this project, was, the, the photography project was to create empathy towards the plight of these struggling Americans. Um, so essentially, if you think about it, this is a government, a federal government program taking pictures of everyday Americans to convince legislators and also middle and upper class people who may not have been as uh, personally affected by the economic downturn uh, to get them on board with the New Deal initiative. So this is propaganda. I'm just going to use the word like these photos are meant to be persuasive to show uh, the American public um, why they should care about the New Deal and why they should care about the plight of everyday Americans. So if you think about of these photos in that context, like they are communicating a certain kind of message and 
And part of what I uh, set out to do was to decode these messages. And mm -hmm. while it's all speculative, that's that's what historians do. We take our the best <laughs> evidence that we have in front of us right. and, and try to make claims about it. Um, and you, it was fascinating to me, all of the photographers wrote the captions for it. Um, and they were coming at it from their perspective. And again, possibly a propaganda, um, just a propaganda angle. Right. Um, and there's another slide, isn't there, of, of more? Yeah. Of the, yeah. Yeah. These are a couple additional photos here from, from G's Bend. Um, there's G's Bend, we all know uh, as quilt enthusiasts <clears throat> of this legendary community now, because in the 21st century, their quilts have become world famous. Right, um, right. But this is one of the first times outsiders came into G's Bend. And isn't it fascinating that they were also taking pictures of, of the quilts that were made in this community, among other things? Um, However, these are these are really posed. If you can right, see, right. Um, there's a the the quilt top that's on the bed is the same quilt top that's being used as a prop uh, next to the sewing machine, showing the the quilt making in progress. Um, so, and we we see and this is something that's commonly uh, occurs in a lot of these Farm Security Administration photos. Is you can kind of see how things are being moved around. Uh, perhaps staged to a degree, um, it's hard to know um, how much veracity and how much how much is, is really part of just the composition. Of course, photographers are always composing their work, but right. you can tell that um, this quilt is, is sort of moving around in the space. Um, and there's also this before and after effect that goes on with these um, uh, G's Ben photos in particular, this is from a couple years later, um, after the Farm Security Administration has actually come into G's Bend and bought up the entire, this former plantation and turned it into a planned community. And there were close to a hundred planned communities throughout the United States that um, are really a form of, um, you know, collectivism. There would always be a community center and every community center would have a home ec room with sewing machines and quilting frames and usually a home economist on staff. And there's some home economists here. Um, and then they built new um, cottages for all the families and they each had a plot of land to grow um, subsistence agriculture on. Um, but one of the things you see here, are these, these girls in, in G's Bend, these are part of the um, National Youth Administration, which is another one of the alphabet soup agencies. And they're learning how to make bedspreads. And uh, these look different than the quilts that were made here in this room, but they also mm -hmm. look quite different than the quilts we imagine coming from G's Ben. Like we've all seen the G's right. Ben quilts and these are not those. Um, so it's interesting to think about how the governmental workers who are coming into these communities affected the types of quilts uh, and quilt making that were was taking place. Um, so th this, oh, go ahead, Maren. I was just going to say, we did get a question just now from someone outside the U.S. who is hoping you could clarify a little bit more exactly what the deal, the new deal was intended to do. Um, sure, absolutely. So just maybe That's a it. snip of more context. Yeah. That is such a great question uh, and important context, particularly uh, if you haven't uh, been steeped in uh the, the American history courses many of us uh, may have taken in, in middle school and high school. Um, so the New Deal is the name that we refer to for the, um, the Franklin Roosevelt administration's efforts to combat the Great Depression. And it's centered on uh, reform, so reform of the economy, reform of agriculture, relief, actually what, what is often called the dole, the giving money to those who are struggling. Um, it, it eventually switched to being part of what's called the Works Progress Administration, which paid people mm -hmm. to work rather than just giving handouts. Um, and also, so it's reform, relief, and recovery, just kind of getting getting the nation back uh, on its feet um, uh, during this economic downturn. Um, so the projects are wide ranging and sometimes even right. in, have conflicting goals, but um, right. it's all of these federal programs. And again, the, the your book is just steeped in detail. And yes, I learned um, 
about the New Deal in my education, but as many of us are learning now, it isn't always exactly the way it happens. I mean, you you go into discussion about the colonial revival and a lot of the myths that are breaking from, from that period. Um, and then the same with the New Deal era, picking apart, explaining these different organizations and um, so again, packed, packed, packed with info. So this this photograph, um, two things. One of the big surprises for me, I had no idea about the planned communities that you um, discuss in the book. I just had no idea that that was happened. Um, I'm curious, are any of those communities still exist today in some form? Probably not. Um, I mean, not being subsidized by the government, but yes. did towns uh, grow uh, up. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. There are there are some of these um, towns exist as just you know they're no longer. Um, I mean, they were set up as this kind of hybrid where the federal government came in and bought the land and uh, created this community, um, and then they had low interest loans for. Um, uh, the, the family, sometimes these were created when an industry shut down, like a coal mining industry shut down in Tennessee, and that's where Cumberland uh, Farms, uh, I believe that's the name of that, that planned community, was, was created. And those buildings still exist today, and they uh -huh. are still in, in use, but it doesn't exist as a, a intentional community the same way. Same is true for Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, there were several... Um, suburban garden uh, planned communities right, that were right. just located adjacent to cities, um, but similarly had uh, all the structures and the community centers. And um, often often some of these towns had their own industries. Sometimes they had like weaving workshops. Uh, I don't, I couldn't find evidence of quilt making as an industry in any of these planned right. communities, but it was more a uh, social and leisure activity there were often quilt clubs that were formed. And then there were small um, home industries and makers from that time Definitely. period that um, did create businesses. Um, Absolutely. You, you start naming some of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anne Orr was one. Yeah, right. <laughs> Right. This is the time period um, in which um, the commercial circulation of quilt patterns is really uh, on the rise. And like every newspaper has a syndicated quilt right. column. Um, and some of the bigger newspapers have, you know, their own, you know, Chicago Tribune or Kansas City Star have, have kind of famous um, quilt columnists who publish patterns. Um, at the same time, some of those same designers are running cottage industries. And then there's right. all the way down to like, pretty poor, impoverished women, like making quilts that they sell for two or three dollars, um, right, just as, right. as what we now, we kind of call pin money, you know, but it was more than pin money because when you're destitute and you don't have any other income, uh, two or three dollars um, is kind of essential. Right. Marie Webster, of course, was one of, of those course, people, yeah. a fellow Hoosier. Yeah. Yannick and I are both from Indiana. That's right. So this photograph also brings up the topic um, of the um, sewing sewing rooms. Was that oh, the, yeah, the WPA sewing rooms, right. So, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Again, another fascinating um, piece of information to learn. And these were all over the country. That's um, right. Can you talk? They a were, little and and they they and these, um, we we're familiar probably with WPA projects that built roads or dams, right, uh, right. did big infrastructure projects, but women mm. who were who qualified to qualify, you had to be the head of household, um, meaning you didn't have a father or husband to take care of you, um, and th those women could get jobs in WPA sewing rooms, predominantly those sewing rooms made garments. Uh, mm. Lots of them also made mattresses, but I found yeah, lots yeah. and lots of evidence of hundreds of thousands of um, quilts that were produced in WPA sewing rooms. And sometimes they were very utilitarian, like whole cloth comforters. Mm. And sometimes they used the leftovers from the garment making and, um, 
and produced what we think of as patchwork quilts. Um, and those, anything produced in the WPA sewing rooms was given to the needy. Um, it couldn't be sold. Yeah. The photo of the mattress, the, the women stuffing the mattresses right. with, yeah. with extra cotton that, you know, wasn't being used and um, just in that whole industry of making mattresses. So. Right. Absolutely. Um, and there were, uh, there was commodity cotton because the cotton prices plummeted during, during the Great Depression. And so the government had all this cotton that it wanted to find a use for. Um, so it was paying uh, farmers, you know, uh, for their crops, even though there was no market or industry for it. So um, there was a lot of commodity cotton distributed to WPA sewing rooms and where women would card the cotton, which is like straightening right. the fibers um, to, among other things, make great quilt batting um, out of right, it. Right, right, right. Um, did we skip the album quilt? One of my Let's favorite. Let's see. Here it is. Let's yes, go back yes, to it. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. um, Which is in the exhibition. And of course, it's a favorite quilt of mine. And we, the maker is unidentified. Um, and I want to just uh, do a quote from the book, page 35 oh. in chapter one. You come, you write this. Southern rural women, both black and white, developed haphazard and improvisational quilt making techniques. Can you say more of how you came to that um, conclusion. Sure, and, and this is, you know, um, we see more of these pat these quilts that don't have a, um, a pattern per se emerging mm -hmm. uh, during this time period, not to say that they didn't exist uh, before the 1930s. Um, right, right. I hesitate yeah. to ever use terms like never or always because we, we always can find exceptions uh, to right, any right. claims. But, um, you see a lot more of the sort of um, improvisational quilt making style taking place. This, this quilt looks like it's a bunch of different projects that were started and all put together. Maybe that's the case, but it also became fashionable to put your bits and pieces together. Um, the great quilt historian Barbara Brackman um, wrote a short piece um, on the quilt index about being fashionable and frugal. And it was really eye-opening to me when I was reading it um, because she talks about fiesta wear, the, the, um, the ceramic dishes yeah. that come in lots of different colors that are intended right. for you to mix and match. Right. And that, that uh, the Homer Laughlin uh, company um, introduces those in the 1930s. And it makes a lot of sense. This whole, like, uh, we're just going to bring everything together. It doesn't have to all match. Uh, it's like right. more fun. Uh, and that was part of the fashion. Um, so we do see scrap quilts like this, but we also see scrap quilts that, um, like the, the quilt that's on the cover of the book um, is a scrap quilt made from feed sacks, but it's in a very formal design, a more colonial revival design from the era. It's a broken broken star uh, is the name of that pattern, but yeah. it's using feed sacks and uh, bits and pieces of stuff. Um, just as this one, but it's in a very different kind of execution. Which leads me, I want to go over to this Britchy quilt that we saw for a moment. This is yes, another yeah. scrap quilt, which right. is a totally different look and feel, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, using what was had what was around and worn out and could mm -hmm. was still salvageable. I mean, it certainly was the conclusion that I came to after collecting the collection that I came about was a lot of you know poor white women as well as poor black women um, were making similar quilts. I do feel that African American women on some level had more permission to do this and certainly there are lots of um, studies about what came, what was brought from Africa, what was brought not even just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and how that came out in their quilts. But um, you do have a fascinating piece about um, Cuesta Benberry's mother-in-law and her connection with uh, living at that time and her quilts. 
Um, and Cuesta was just one of the best of the quilt historians um, out oh, here there. It is. I'll just uh, highlight this. It's the tulip quilt that you can see yeah. on the right side of the gallery here, um, which has a really amazing account that uh, the great Cuesta Benberry recorded uh, about her mother-in-law who lived in Western Kentucky, African-American rural woman. And uh, one year during the depression, uh, a federal worker um, who Cuesta referred to as a WPA uh, worker, social worker, probably wasn't a social worker, but it was probably some kind of um, uh, either farm security administration or WPA. Um, they called them uh, supervisors who would come and give you mm -hmm. give people advice about how to keep their homes and how to grow agriculture. Um, she distributed this pattern um, to, to Minnie. And uh, then in the spring, when Minnie and a number of other African-American women from the, from the larger rural area all showed up at the churchyard to, to quilt, they'd all made quilts in the same pattern. And so they started calling it the WPA tulip. Um, but that's another example of how uh, federal workers were kind of influencing the actual design of, of quilts. And, and, and Quest, uh, of, among her many, many research projects, um, it really was important to her to get that message out that African-American quilts, quilt makers made the whole gamut of styles from very what are considered improvisational to very traditional patterns. Um, and I'd say Carolyn Maslumi today is also, you know, advocates that just the wide, wide breadth of, of quilt making. Um, and I think so, we can really we can really see in the photos of uh, the Farm Security Administration ones and other WPA, there were lots of different photography things going on during this area documenting the depression. But when we see the quilts, you can see these improvisational scrap quilts are in uh, very temporary housing uh, among migrant farm laborers. They're in sharecropping homes, they're in small towns, and and it is both races, white white and black people, and there's a number of Mexicans uh, in southern mm -hmm. Texas also posed with quilts. Um, mm -hmm. So it, to me, it really suggests that we, we need to re, be very cautious about uh, naming the race of a quilt when we don't mm -hmm. know who the quilt maker is. Right, right. Um, and then, so back to the sewing rooms. Um, mm -hmm. Again, fascinating to read about, read histories from the women that participated in those. <laughs> and again, often those instructors were white women coming into mm -hmm. communities of color. Um, mm -hmm. And you use quotes like imposing standards and tastes. Um, mm -hmm. whose standards, whose tastes are getting taught to right. yeah. um, poor um, women. Um, and then even a bigger topic, and we'll, we're going to touch on it a little bit in a quilt coming up, of, of racism. Can you imagine sure. that okay. happening? Yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll bring this one up. Is this the quilt? Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, what, just the title of this. Um, and again, you go into some wonderful documentation and writing on how the name had changed over time and um, how it was used. But let's talk a little bit about this. Sure. This is a quilt um, that uh, one of the quilts that we collectively now call the TVA quilts. The TVA was yeah. the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, which was an uh, initiative that um, built dams on the Tennessee River, um, which covers parts of Tennessee, Alabama, uh, Western Kentucky. Um, and Ruth Clement Bond, who designed this quilt, was married to the um, highest ranking African-American employee of the TVA. And the TVA was, like all federal programs, was supposed to be... Um, uh, <laughs> equal um, for all races. Um, however, this is the Jim Crow era, and that was not always so true. And particularly, uh, the federal government deferred to what they called local standards uh, in right. the South. So 
uh, the villages where workers were building these dams that were going to provide both rural, rural um, electrification as well as recreational areas built, you know, um, reservoirs um, uh, in the dammed rivers. Um, uh, there were segregated villages. Um, <laughs> African Americans generally uh, didn't have access to the same recreational facilities. A lot right, of the, the right. rural homes were not actually electrified. But, but Ruth Clement Bond uh, organized a group of women to do a home beautification project. And she designed these quilts that are wildly modernist and uh, uh, don't look yeah. like anything else we see in quilts. They look like Aaron Douglas murals, who was a Harlem Renaissance painter. Right. Um, but this, yeah, lazy man was a term that some of the women used to refer to this quilt, and it's hard to say exactly where that, that title came from. Ruth, Ruth Bond didn't use it herself, um, right. but this right. is one of several quilts in a series, um, and they were made um, in multiple villages uh, in the Tennessee Valley, and then and I found three instances where they were given to white administrators of the new deal which right, is a right. very interesting right. gift um go ahead i think oh. that they were you know they weren't just thank you gifts they were more like look we're here uh we are empowered um mm -hmm. we are contributing to not just the tva but to the whole society and I, I view them, that's how I interpret these quilts, um, rather than as, especially when they're given as gifts, they aren't just like, thank you, uh, um, but they are kind of, they have a more political message than that. Um, Absolutely, I think these yeah. are about um, civil rights, and, yeah, they, and think, Ruth Bond and her husband were civil rights workers. And the term Black Power. Yeah, I years. know. Yeah, we don't have um, that picture. But, I know. But I there's know. another another quilt where a fist is emerging out of the ground, and a black, they called a black it. fist, mm -hmm. a, a black fist, a black person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just yeah, that term being used back then, um, and yeah, that was again new, fascinating information, and then to see or you know what was the connection of how that term then began to be used in the 1960s um were there connections i know i would love through? to know what that how to tie those or connect those dots but um wouldn't that be something if uh it was a quilt that originated the term i know i know um another title you write uh, that was given to this quilt was uncle sam helping hand so the uh, uncle Sam's hand is the white hand to me that looks more like it's a fist it isn't this gentle helping hand of this person um so that's so, the title that the TVA itself started right, to use of course both, uh, of many course. many decades later and so of course they're presenting uh their the government in in a very positive light where the women at this time period viewed it as a right. The, the figure in the middle is in tension between the arm of the government and the life of leisure um, and is kind of being pulled in both directions. And, and you also in the book talk about the good intentions that were that were really there um, by many of the people running these various programs, um, the people participating. Um, and there were good intentions about it but again in looking back and looking at it um and then analyzing it and just realizing yes racism still existed at that time Absolutely. and um yeah it's it's important to remember for many african americans particularly in the rural south the Great Depression was not new. It didn't change anything. It, right. it was a continuation of the right. um, sort of impoverished existence um, that had already already been like through Reconstruction and, and in the decades, um, uh, early decades of the 20th century uh, under the, the Jim Crow laws. Um, right. But um, it is, you know, it's important to think, uh, to, to, to put it in context and and to sort of, Think about what that time period was like and um you know 
not to excuse the kinds of racism, but it was very, uh, there was a huge amount of structural racism, even within the government and even within all of these New Deal programs. Yeah. So we okay. should talk a yep. little bit yes. about electoral yes. politics. So there's a number of quilts uh, feature <laughs> in the book, um, some in the exhibit as well that um, are rather than the government imposing their ideas, it's right. like grassroots right. quilt makers sort of showing their loyalty to, to the government or to the New Deal. There's all kinds of, there's Blue Eagle National Recovery Act quilts and right. WPA quilts. And tell PBA. us about this quilt because <laughs> this one, uh, you have the origin story. Right. Um, this is a really exciting find for me, and I'll, I'll again, try to be brief. Um, when the American Quilt came out, a friend from high school said, you've got to do an exhibition at Huntington College of your quilts and a talk, and um, I'll gather up the quilts. And I had started going to farm auctions and household auctions when I was in high school in the 60s, and I never saw a quilt. Um, and so she came up with this incredible exhibition of family quilts that um, people were happy to share them. And it was a beautiful exhibition. Well, this was one of the quilts that came out. This was in a family that were actually very good friends of my parents. And I was, I was just shocked when I saw this quilt for the first time. Um, and then to do some more research on it and really identify um, find Mary Clara Milligan Kindler Moore in the census records um, and the history of the origin of that rooster as a symbol for the Democratic Party. And it originated in Indiana. Um, it was several other Midwest states used it as well. And on the ballots, there would be a rooster and you could put an X, you know, over it, indicating I'm voting a straight democratic ticket. Um, and so then this interpretation of hers and you compare it to an Ann or um, type of quilt of this pointillist um, construction. Um, again, to me, it's just brilliant. I, um, there's a long story that we'll I'll tell you later and <laughs> of how then it finally this came. Is, and this is just yeah. one example of right. quilters, quilters who um, uh, were putting their actual electoral politics right. into quilts. Um, there's a great example of one that's in the FDR library um, that has it's all donkeys and right. each donkey has the election returns from 1932, 1936, 1940. Um, there's another one that has like, you know, it's basically like the uh, electoral college count. Um, this was a quilt that's in the North Carolina State Museum, um, uh, you know, that gives the actual electoral college count numbers for, for each state um, over th the three elections that, that FDR won um, as well, or three, four, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, and it's part, really interesting. Oh. We think of Today, you know, we, we are accustomed to people stitching their political um, perspectives into quilts. This is something that's become quite commonplace in the 21st century, but it's got deep roots. Right. Um, and the story that did come with this quilt was that she sent it to Roosevelt in the first term. Um, she wanted him to have it. And it was sent back, you know, thanking for it, but I can't take care of it well enough you should. Unfortunately, you know, none of that um, correspondence exists today. But then you found that, I mean, there were there hundreds or thousands. I mean, of it's, it's hard sent to, to the president sure, and, but... <laughs> and the first lady, and that some of those do exist and are in the Roosevelt exactly. Library. But um, the White House must have had just stacks and stacks and stacks of quilts and quilt tops that were being sent to them. Yeah, and and back then, uh, this is research I attribute to Kyra Hicks, a uh, um, great great scholar of uh, African American quilts. Um, that there were some, there wasn't a gift uh, keeping registry the same, or the gift giving registry the same way there would be now, where there's right. all kinds of ethics and compliance issues. And, and Kyra tried to track down records of where all the quilts may have gone that were given to the Roosevelt's. Um, sometimes we I found like 
documentation of them in some of these small town newspapers where they'll comment on so and so sent a quilt to to Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, right. Uh, it's really fascinating that this was such a commonplace thing to to send quilts to the White House. Um, yeah. And there were quilts sent to other elected officials as well. Um, but we don't know like a, a total number or anything like right, that. It's all right. kind of bits and pieces. Um, um, Marin, how are we doing on time? Yeah. Do you want us to address some of these questions? Well, actually, there have been a few questions and in in essence, you've, I think you've addressed them for the most part. Um, right. <laughs> I do have some comments from people um, who, uh, you raised that question, Roderick, what generation are you? Uh, did you grow up during the Great Depression or are you descended from people who did? And I thought if we, you know, we have a few minutes here and I thought I could read a few of them because they're really interesting and they're, and they're quite relevant to some of the topics you've been bringing up. So Anne T says, uh, my parents were depression era children, lots of stories about being thrifty, reusing, recycling. Also, my mother talked about having gravy sandwiches to feed their family mm. of 10. So mm. there's a story for you. Right, right. <laughs> um, Jules M says, my parents lived through the depression. When I started quilting, dad questioned that I purchased fabric to make the quilts as his mom quilted with clothing scraps. So uh, when you yeah. uh, when you grow up in that environment of uh, the necessity of make do and mend, it's it's kind of hard to then shed that. And you and I know it gets passed down to later generations. And that's a really yeah. important point, Marn. And one that I, I see almost two contradictory um, uh, results from so this depression mentality that we're talking about the making do reusing things on one hand that leads some people to then continue this trajectory of scrimping and saving um you know like the mentality of of my own grandparents um but then there's also we know that there's this lull in quilt making that occurs from the 1940s really through the 60s before the um the second great uh, quilt revival of the 20th century takes place, begins in the 1970s. Um, I speculate that some of it is a desire to leave the drudgery behind. Um, if yeah, you think of these I... people who are making quilts, not because they loved quilt making, but because they had to, whether that they had to because they were working in a WP sewing room or they had to just to keep their family warm. They were yeah. pretty excited to buy a chenille bedspread right, once the like right. 1940s. Came, you know? Yeah. And I have two quotations here from some of our audience members that directly relate to that. Daisy says, I believe that some of my quilt family's quilt history was lost because my grandmother, who lived through the depression, felt that quilts represented poverty and yeah, didn't want yeah. to hold on I've, to them. I've heard that too. And Absolutely. Pam says, um, similarly, Pam says, interestingly, my mother in adulthood had a strong dislike for any fabric with tiny prints, which she termed, quote unquote, chicken feed. Later, as a quilter, <laughs> I figured out she must have had clothing made from feed sacks containing right, chicken right, feed for their animals right, and right. grew to hate those clothes. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's two yeah. strong threads happening here, um, okay. embracing yeah. that thriftiness or rejecting it, depending on your own personal experience and, and situation. And now we embrace and love the um, quilts that were made from flower feed, sugar sack <laughs> materials and identifying. I asked Yannickin to put this slide in too. And again, another photo of, from the period, but um, I wondered if those two little boys were put in those overalls to <laughs> mimic the the overall Sam or whatever that they had called that pattern or was that posed or did they show up that day? Well, you know overall? what? I don't have the, I don't have the picture here, but there is a oh, picture from yeah. this community of the the men uh, similarly all lined up with their um, in silage cutter. Um, uh, and they're all wearing overalls. So yeah. it yes. probably yeah. was uh, just a common I mean, it is pretty cute here. That it uh, is, it, right? But... Uh, this is this is an example of a mutual aid group, and these uh, I found so many records of of different quilting clubs, sewing groups, um, 
that they're doing it, yes, for the socializing and they're doing it to like the socially productive sitting around a quilt frame working on something together, but they're also often doing it as a form of mutual aid. These women um, would, they, some of the documentation from Dorothea Lang, the photographer who took mm -hmm. this, is they would, um, you know, sell, raffle off a quilt and take right. those, that $17 and give it to a family in need. Right. Um, there were migratory labor camps up and down the West Coast. This is, you know, uh, mm -hmm. lots of migrant farm laborers moved West in search of work and the, the government created camps. And at these camps, they would, they would even have, one of these camps had quilts that you could check out. So a new family arriving at the yeah, camp could yeah, check out a yeah. quilt, like you'd check out a book at the library. So they made sure that the, this, the helping hands clubs or the, um, there were ones called the welcoming clubs or the happy hour clubs, um, would would look after one another and the mutual aid that really became such a hallmark of the great depression i think is is a is a lovely lasting legacy which is interesting because it's separate from the government intervention it's like mm -hmm. people turning to one another and helping each other out right 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 and um oh, we oh, we ahead. have just eight minutes left Ooh. and i'm hoping yannickin i know that you did include some images of the road to recovery quilt oh, and i yes, think everyone absolutely. would love to see that yeah. and hear yes. the story uh, behind that sure i will just do a very quick um, passage yeah. through these last slides so you don't miss anything this is roosevelt rose which was a commercially published pattern um commemorating the roosevelts um this is a 1933 World's Fair quilt called Calendar, which is just amazing. Here's a little detail mm -hmm. of some of that imagery. But this is the quilt Maren was just referring to. Um, just to let you know how it found its way to my book, um, I'd given a remote lecture in spring of 2021 while I was in the midst of a lot of this research. And Susan Salser, who is the granddaughter of Mary Gasparic, found this recording on YouTube and tracked me down, emailed me and said, I have a quilt that you should include in your book. <laughs> and <laughs> why did she ever? Um, this is her her grandmother's quilt. Mary Gasparic um, was born in Hungary and immigrated to Chicago in the uh, early 20th century in the first decade. I, I don't want to get the year incorrect. Um, but in 1933 in Chicago, this is when the great... Um, Sears Century of Progress quilt contest is taking place in conjunction with the Chicago World's Fair. And Mary right. starts to see quilts for the first time. Um, she had uh, needlework and embroidery skills that she brought with her from Hungary, but she became an expert quilt maker. And by the time the 1939 World's Fair uh, was occurring in New York City, she entered this quilt, which she called Road to Recovery, in that contest, I don't know how she didn't win. Um, this quilt <laughs> blew me away once I got to see it in person. So it's worth mm. your your trip to Nebraska um, if you can make it happen. I don't know how well some of these details show up on the slide, um, but you can see the years uh, in the quilting stitches each year of the depression. You can see 1937 here, oh, 1938. I hadn't noticed that. It's all sneaking through the road all the way up to what you see here, the obelisk, these are like the, <laughs> the monuments that were built as part of the New York World's Fair. Um, right. But this is Mary's story of emerging out of the Great Depression um, on the other side. Um, and it's just a spectacular uh, piece. Um, so grateful to um, Mary's grandchildren for loaning it to the exhibition and, and letting us publish it in the book as well. Yeah, I I think I saw that Susan is here with us today. So yeah, let That's me wonderful. extend our Hi, gratitude as well from the museum. Yeah. It's a fantastic quilt. And as Yannickin said, if you come to Nebraska for no other reason, it is it is just stunning and you'll love it. Um, yeah. And I so, highly encourage people to go to Lincoln, Nebraska, to the <laughs> International Quilt Museum. It is so definitely worth the trip. And Yannickin, your book, the exhibition is certainly... Um, it's in the, I don't know, is zeitgeist the right word? Um, there happens to be an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum here in New York. So if it's happening in um, Lincoln, Nebraska, and the Met is also doing it, they have a show called Art for the Millions, American Culture and Politics in the 1930s. Um, and 
a lot of the same WPA photographs, um, dresses, posters. It's more from a political side. Um, there was a wonderful poster of a washing machine. Um, <laughs> and I forget now the um, the um, agency. It's another initial agency that that came from. But um, and we didn't even get, and the book does go into, brings it into contemporary and some of the things that yeah. co COVID um, similarities in terms of what was happening in the country and what still is happening during, right. as it, it was during the depression and the things that have grown Yeah, out and of that it. really was, that hit me. So I was, I had my first and so far only sabbatical from the university I teach at um, in spring of 20. 20 and I was diving into this research and of course as you all know by March of 2020 I, I mean all I received grant funding to go to visit archives and museums and all <laughs> kinds of stuff none of that was happening um but oddly my research started to feel so much more relevant as we then had the largest in the United States the largest uh relief package federal relief package since the great depression since the new deal and mm -hmm. um people started making quilts in huge numbers. I think we're really having a quilt renaissance right now because so many people were stuck at home those months, uh, oh, yeah. years, uh, myself included, like turning to their own scrap bags and stitching their hopes and dreams and visions uh, in, into quilts, just like um, the people were doing during the Great Depression. Absolutely. Bringing it forward to the present day is, yeah, it's, it's, uh, those parallels are profound, really. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows that quilt making is relevant <laughs> in all generations, really. Um, and we are just about out of time. So I do want to thank our discussants today, Roderick Kirikoff and Yannick and Smucker. Um, I'll put a plug in. If you can come to the International Quilt Museum in the Ew. spring, you'll get to see a new deal for quilts. But we will also have an entire exhibition about feed sacks. So if you're a feed sack oh, fan, <laughs> starting in mid-January, an entire gallery filled with quilts made from feed sack. It's been a wonderful year of textile talks. Uh, we want to thank everyone who has attended one this year. And as you know, textile talks will be on a break during the holiday season. Uh, the next one will be on January 3rd with uh, the Quilt Alliance. They will be doing a QSOS interview, a Quilters Save Our Stories interview with Susan Hudson and an interview done by Teresa Durye Wong. So be sure to sign up for the next, uh, the first one in the new year and we will see you again uh, in 2024. So thank you, Roderick and Yannikin. Thank you, everybody. I knew, Yannick, and we could have talked for <laughs> another hour. <laughs> I, I hope we have an opportunity to, to at least well, continue our discussion. <laughs> um, I'm advocating for the textile talks to be longer, at least an hour and a half. Um, <laughs> but okay. I'm, I may be a lone voice in the. Thank you, Marin, for shepherding this on all levels through this. This was a lot of fun. I'm really glad we did it. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you later. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.